We can now bring in uh, Stephen Hall, lecturer in Russian and post-Soviet politics. Uh, thank you very much for joining us here on uh, France 24. Uh, we had quite a crowd that gathered uh, outside uh, this church in Moscow and outside the cemetery as Alexei Navalny was laid to rest. Are you surprised that there have been no arrests reported so far? No. Really, uh, the what generally happens is that the police or security services will pick up people afterwards. There was a lot of media attention, primarily from the Western media and also Russian opposition channels on Navalny's funeral. Of uh, as you do it, they won't pick them up, as it were, live on television. They will wait until afterwards. Where does his death leave Russia's opposition? Well, that's a difficult question to answer. Navalny was the leader of the Russian opposition. Many of the other opposition politicians are in uh, either in exile or in jail. There are a few that are still in Russia. Yekaterina Tumsova, Boris Nadezhdin, possibly as well. Well, he is in Russia, possibly he's opposition. Um, and that, so it is certainly a difficult time for the Russian opposition. And it's going to be very hard for those Russians who are opposed to Putin to be able to find a way to unite and show that they're the majority of opposition to Putin at the current time. Uh, we had uh, Alexei Navalny's widow, Yulia Navalny, who spoke to EU lawmakers just this week, and she called Vladimir Putin a gangster. She blamed mm. him for Alexei Navalny's uh, death. Uh, something she said that was interesting, she told EU lawmakers that to take on Vladimir Putin, you can't do the regular route of sanctions. You need to, to be innovative. Uh, how does one challenge Vladimir Putin, really? This is the difficulty, certainly. Putin has consolidated power. He is a hegemonic authoritarian, a person in a personist autocracy of his own making. Certainly, you go, you can go after assets for his uh, inner circle and in the West if they are still there. And by all accounts, they are. You can go after the elites who are living in the West but criticizing the West whenever they feel necessary. That is one approach, certainly. But, but, but Stephen Hall, I just but want to jump in there because in because when the war in when Russia's invasion uh, began, mm. we had the EU, the United States, was like swung into action and started uh, obviously sanctioning. Uh, a lot of Vladimir Putin's inner circle because they thought that you get to the inner circle, you will get to Vladimir Putin. They haven't succeeded in getting to Vladimir Putin, have they? To an extent, they haven't been able to get to Vladimir Putin, but the, the sanctions have been, whilst they have been fairly extensive, they haven't targeted the individuals that are necessary and... There was also like like who what like who have done in more and what I was trying to get to who who have they, well, they not targeted the, uh, in, well in terms of what has been able to get people Russia has been able to get round the sanctions fairly easily sanctions are a blunt tool and therefore they will take time to have an effect and certainly there is more that can be needs to be done the simple fact that other some members of the elite some companies haven't been targeted. The fact that the elites, as I was trying to say, are able to travel to London, to Paris, to Berlin, this should also be stopped. And it's not just about the elites. What the West needs to be do, do, and the European Commission has been quite clear about this, is to try and split Russian society away from supporting from supporting Putin. It also needs to be that the Russians should be shown that they are not to be blamed in the same way that Putin is for this war. There is so much more that needs to be done in supporting the Russian opposition in exile, in supporting Russian media in exile, to try and produce an atmosphere that can show that Russians are alone in this situation. Now, of course, we have uh, the elections that's going to be taking place in two weeks' time. Uh, Vladimir Putin obviously expected uh, to secure that vote. No surprises there. Uh, but let's talk about the state of Russia's economy, because uh, we've had, uh, as we've said, the sanctions that mm -hmm. have been in effect for over two years now. It was expected to, to deal a blow to Russia's economy. It hasn't. Uh, we obviously had the, the, the U.S. President Joe Biden, who said that the sanctions would reduce uh, the, the 
ruble to rubble. It has that has not happened mm. either. Uh, so Vladimir Putin is running uh, with an economy th th that is growing despite everything. He is running with he is certainly running with an economy that is growing. The sanctions haven't been as effective as I think the West was hoping. Russia's economy is much bigger than was, uh, you know, other countries that have been sanctioned in the past. So it was always going to be tough. More importantly, I think the Russian economy is overheating. It is based on a war economy at the moment. Putin is in, a very, is in a difficult situation. He has to justify continuing the war because of what has happened so far in the number of people, or men, I should say, who have been killed. So he needs to maintain the war economy. At the same time, he also needs to maintain the, the living standards that Russians are experiencing. That's very hard to do at the moment. And as I say, the economy is overheating. Now, it all depends on what can happen in terms of what the future will hold. But I think that with more pressure, certainly the economy can be made to overheat and it will become increasingly difficult for the Kremlin to maintain the cost of the land standards of living for the Russian population. And this may lead to further protests. Now we have the the war in Ukraine that continues. Vladimir Putin, of course, pouring in all the resources and manpower necessary. And we've seen recent uh, gains on the battlefield. Of course, we've had Avdivka, which uh, the Russians uh, claim to have taken. Uh, we have Ukrainian officials who are admitting mm. that, that the situation on the battlefield is, in fact, quite difficult uh, and dangerous. I mean, it seems that Vladimir Putin is willing to do whatever it can. Uh, and, and, you know, Ukraine is outgunned and outnumbered on the battlefield. Well, I mean, Vladimir Putin, it was quite clear from the very <coughs> beginning in terms of even before the full-scale full -scale invasion by Russia in 2022, that Putin saw Ukraine as a as an existential issue. He saw Ukraine as effectively a part of Russia. He was willing to die on the hill that is Ukraine. The West hasn't been. And the simple fact is that the West has said, should have come up with a better slogan than we will support Ukraine for as long as it takes, because that slogan is meaningless. What it should have been is, we will support Ukraine to win this war as quickly as possible. And the West needs to be doing a lot more in terms of supporting Ukraine, because it is going to be an issue. If Ukraine does collapse, if the Ukraine, if Ukraine is subsumed into Russia, or if Putin is able to spin that he has beaten NATO, as increasingly may be the case, that's going to be existentially problematic for the West. But Stephen, what, what more should the West be doing? Should, should the West, uh, as Emmanuel Macron suggested, be sending boots on the ground? Uh, because, the, I, you know, we've had all these slogans, we'll support Ukraine for as long as it mm. takes. One of the things that uh, this war has shown was that NATO was united, but then Emmanuel Macron makes a statement like that and it shows how divided all the countries are. It does show, and we're talking about the West as in one entity. The, the collective West is multiple states. Macron's statement about putting boots on the ground has been uh, attacked by a number of states, although the Baltics and I believe the Netherlands have actually said that they would do that if necessary. What I'm saying is you don't need to necessarily put soldiers on the ground. It's not going to try and trying to de-escalate, as it were. NATO does not need to get involved as such. But the West needs to start putting its, start telling its electorate that we are effectively at war. We need to put ourselves into a war economy and start building up the reserves, not only for themselves, but also for Ukraine. They are far behind now in, from Russia. Putin alluded to it in his state of the address to uh, Russia yes, but yesterday, that Russia is on, in terms of factories, they're on three ships building with munitions and drones and various other pieces necessary, obviously, for fighting the war. Mm. The West is way behind on this, and Ukraine cannot is not self-sufficient in terms of munitions, and the West needs to maintain and increase its support as much as it can in the coming months. We'll see how, how that support continues, Stephen Hall. We're going to have to leave it there. Thank you very much for joining us on the programme today. Thank you.